Good evening. Thank you so much for coming this evening. We're glad to have you here with us for this very interesting program that I have in store for you tonight. My name is Marlis Leon, and I'm the Adult Library Services, the, the Adult Services Librarian. Turn that around. Tonight, the Council Bluffs Public Library has a circulating, has been circulating a unique collection of art prints since the 1970s in the old Carnegie Building on by Bayless Park, now the Union Pacific Railroad Museum. Many of these pieces are by classic artists over time. We have refreshed the collection through the years and are still circulating it. Tonight, Gail Lamberts, a retired employee of our library with an art degree from Iowa State, will take us on a docent tour of some of our own art prints that you can check out for your home or your office. If you have any questions, um, please share them with us on the, the Zoom question and answer page or in the bottom chat box. And now we're gonna turn the program over to Gail. Good evening. Okay, tonight we're gonna to start with a little context um, about the, the art world. In um, France, in, uh, from the Renaissance on, that was the center of the art world. And they wanted to ensure that they stayed the center of the art world. And so in 1648, they established what was called the Academy de Beaux Arts. And the whole idea behind that academy was to maintain the high artistic standards. Uh, so there were so many rules. Um, the uh, kind of art, the uh, subject matter had to be uh, morally uplifting. So you needed things that were either religious, historical, um, they could be uh, something from classical mythology, but never a slice of life, never something from on the street. No, 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 that would not do. Your uh, subject matter always had to be depicted in the most realistic manner and you never were to see a brush stroke. The finish was absolutely perfect. Okay, and then once a year, there would be an art show. They called it the salon and a panel of judges would decide whether your artwork was worthy or not. Well, by the mid 19th century, after this had been going on for several hundred years, by the mid 19th century, the world was changing very fast. You had scientists deciding uh, that um, the way that color and light was seen by the eye and by physics was something to look into. You had color all of a sudden being put into tubes. Uh, prior to that, if you were an artist, your paint had to be, uh, you you'd have powdered paint in your studio and you'd mix it with binder and, and thinner and as you needed it. If you needed to store a little bit, maybe it would be stored in a pig's bladder or a glass syringe. You certainly had to stay close to your workshop to do your painting. And so all of this exciting stuff was going on in the mid 19th century and photography was making a lot of uh, old art obsolete. And so into this environment came a group of brilliant and resourceful rebels, <laughs> rebel <laughs> artists. And Claude Monet was one of these. And here we have two examples of his work. And so Claude Monet was almost scientific in what he wanted to achieve. He wanted to take uh, his paints, etc., out into the field and paint a picture at a certain time of day to capture the light. And he might do with this one, there's a whole series that are similar that he did in certain different kinds of light conditions. So he had to do it very quickly. So we see his brush strokes, a Academy no-no, you know. So we see his brush strokes. He didn't care about that. He captured the time and the place and the light. That was what he wanted to do. And uh, so corn poppies, uh, this is from, let's see what yours is from. 
um, it was done in 1873 when his family was living in Argentville. And um, by that time, he was, he was a struggling artist. He wasn't playing by the rules. He wasn't making a lot of money. So, um, and he loved to live well. Claude Monet loved to live well. So he owed money to several of his friends, and more importantly, his colorist, the person who provided his paint. So because of that, he went from a palette of 15 colors down to six. So he had okay, lead white, lead white, <laughs> um, crimson, uh, rose matter, chrome green, cadmium yellow, cobalt blue. So all those real basic colors. And in this painting of corn poppies, we can almost pick out those individual colors. Uh, Monet was not interested in necessarily blending the colors on his palette. He wanted our eyes and our brains, the viewers, to do the blending for him. So if you get a chance to come up and look at corn poppies closely, uh, you can pick out the individual colors that he was using. So by the time he was middle age, he was making a good living. Uh, it, was, it was really astounding how quickly uh, Impressionism took, took hold and got people excited. So he was making a good living by then. Um, this next painting he did about 22 years after Corn Poppies. And oh, Corn Poppies is now the original. It's in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Uh, this one is called Sandviken, Norway. And he was there painting uh, while he was visiting relatives. And of course, it looks very much like we imagine Norway, a beautiful snow scene. Uh, but kind of pay attention to the colors that he used to depict the snow. There's several different colors of uh, the blues and the bluish whites. And then, of course, there's some lovely pops of red in the buildings and the beautiful dark bridge. So the original of this is in uh, the Chicago Art Institute now. Yeah. So Monet, uh, he was a very prolific and determined gentleman. He lived a long life. He was 86 when he passed. But um, by middle age, he was quite wealthy. And he and his family moved to uh, a place called Givernay and bought a house and a garden. And he was not interested in traveling. He wanted his peace and quiet. And so he kept enlarging and expanding on that beautiful garden so that he would have endless things to paint. And also, of course, there were lily ponds as well. So even as an old man and his eyesight was going bad, he was working hard. And you can go visit his garden and his home even now. Well, after COVID, <laughs> maybe. Um, so the next one we have here is a painting by Van Gogh, or Van Gogh. So Vincent Van Gogh was born in 1853 in the Netherlands. So Vincent had, he tried several different careers with no luck. He proposed to at least a couple of different ladies with no luck. Mental illness and um, bad social skills kind of plagued him all his life. But at a certain point, he decided, okay, I'm going to become an artist. As an adult, he decides this. And he had a brother, a younger brother, who, uh, Theo, who was, uh, who worked in an art gallery, who was a buyer. And his brother decided, well, I'm going to support you both financially and emotionally as long as I can. And so there is this whole catch of letters from uh, 
CO to vents it back and forth over the years so they can trace uh, this wonderful family history. But so Van Gogh at a certain point, now remember he's up north in the Netherlands and he kind of wanders his way south trying to learn how to paint. And he, his brother Theo it, says, yeah, come to Paris. It's where all, everything's happening. There are, everybody's here who you want to talk to and learn from, and you can live with me. And try that for a little while. But Vincent was not fond of city life. Uh, Paris was too hectic. There were too many people. It just didn't suit. So he headed south to the countryside and he ended up in a place called Arles. And he fell in love with the place. The light, the atmosphere just excited him. And that's where uh, we get so many of the beautiful things that we think of as Van Gogh uh, paintings from his time in the south of France. He loved the light. This particular painting uh, that we have here is called Almond Branches, and it was done in 1890. Um, also in 1890, that was kind of a busy year. Now, one of the things that happened in the mid 19th century was that Japan opened its doors to the West. Japan had been closed you couldn't go in, you couldn't go out of Japan for about 220 years. Commodore Perry uh, negotiated a treaty and that opened up the ports of Japan to trade. And so in 1890, a show of Japanese art came to Paris. Nobody had seen anything like it before. Of course, their experience, you know, was different than Western art. And uh, especially the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists, the people who were interested in innovation and creativity were so excited about what they saw. And Vincent was one of these people who loved that showing. And you can get a feeling in almond branches mm -hmm. for the Oriental. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He painted this uh, in honor of his nephew's birth, uh, his brother Theo and wife, had a little baby, they named him after Vincent, so baby Vincent. So this hung in baby Vincent's room for many years. It was a gift. So Van Gogh, he lived such a troubled, unhappy life, and yet the art he produced was so beautiful. It was like he, the outside world to him was a joy, and he shared that even though he, he was living a really tragic existence, personally. Okay. So, Where is that? Hmm? Where is that? Oh, let's see. Oh, it's in the Van Gogh Museum in um, Amsterdam. The family, you know, you, you worry about so many of these things being lost. But Van Gogh's family, even though the public was, they weren't buying his things during his lifetime, his family valued him, valued his, his work. And um, so I, I heard an interview by one of his descendants recently who said that, oh yeah, he grew up with, you know, one of Van Gogh's things in his parents' dining room and his grandparents had them hanging in their living room. And it was, yeah. Okay. So next, we have the work of Henri Matisse. So Matisse was quite the character. Um, he was born in France to a very wealthy family. He um, went to college, became a lawyer, just like his father wanted. And then at the age of 22, he came down with appendicitis. So he was recuperating at home for several weeks and his mother brought him some paint to help pass the time. So in 
So Matisse gets well and he goes, oh, I'm done with the law. I'm going to be an artist. Bye. <laughs> so, of course, uh, he wanted to go to the Academy Julien, which was one of the Academy approved, you know, uh, schools. So, of course, you have to audition, you have to, you know, apply. And he was refused several times, but he persisted. And finally, one of the teachers there, Augusta Moreau, uh, welcomed him into his classes. So the Academy Julian, of course, was a very traditional institution and teaching in very traditional ways. And Matisse once again goes, no, this isn't for me. <laughs> I, I'm done here. And he, he quits the Academy. Julian and goes out into Paris and just starts um, learning from the people around him. It was such a hotbed of creativity and artists, and they networked and they spoke to each other and they worked to, you know, they worked together. And so uh, Matisse kind of learned on the fly. And then uh, at a certain point, he uh, was hanging out with. Uh, couple bohemian fellows, Duran and uh, Lenach, and uh, they're part of the group that decided they were going to use color for its own sake, completely disassociate color from its objects in nature. So you would have people with green faces and purple lakes and things like that. And they were called the fogs, which is wild beasts. You know, it's like the impressionism, impressionist. That was really a derogatory term originally by an art critic. The same with fogs. It was a derogatory uh, thing that the art critics said. They're wild beasts because they were using color in this ridiculous fashion. So at a certain point, uh, Matisse goes, once again, to the south of France. He goes clear down to the Mediterranean to a little village called Colliere. And like Van Gogh, he loved the light. And this is a painting called uh, Open Window at Colliere. You know what? I think that is upside down. We're going to fix this. <laughs> yep, yep. So open window at Collier. Yeah, that's better. And one of the things that he was learning from the Japanese way of doing things and uh, his friend Cezanne was, you know, when you do perspective, it's total illusion, you know, and it's meant to make things look farther, closer. And uh, no, no, he has, what we see these boats that you know are in the distance. He has them right on the same picture plane as the windowsill. And he wants it all to be equally important. And again, here we're using those really bright, brilliant colors that uh, he was using when he was doing the work as a fall. So this was 1905. And here we're going to jump. This is Henry Matisse as well. I'm in Matisse as well. And this is uh, from 19, 1939. 1939. So by this time, Matisse is uh, well respected and making it a good living. Uh, but uh, of course, he's in France. It's the beginning of World War II. And some of his uh, fellow artists are doing work that reflects the trauma and the violence of the times. Matisse chooses not to do that at all. And so we have this rather happy painting, 1939 music. Um, once again, like Cezanne and the Japanese, it's all on the same picture plane. There's nothing that's supposed to be in the background. Everything's equally important. 
And if you notice, the ladies here are modern ladies. They're in modern dress. What would have been the hairstyle of the time, you can tell that. And also something interesting, although the faces are just those few simple lines, you get uh, an idea that there's a personality behind that face, that these are real people. These are women, not just pretty objects. So that was a little something new for him, giving a little modern emphasis on women. So Matisse, uh, about this time, World War, during World War II, he was diagnosed and treated for cancer. And he never quite regained his strength after that. In his old age, he was actually an invalid. He was in bed. And, but that didn't keep him from making art. He could no longer stand in front of an easel or hold a paintbrush. So he had specially commissioned colored papers made and um, he would sit in bed cutting colored papers and uh, with scissors and making the most beautiful collages. Mm -hmm. And if you look at these pictures here, these leaves, you, you might rec recognize those same sort of motifs in some of his later, uh, his later collages. Where is that transfer? Oh, oh, where is the music? Let's see. He just didn't give up, did he? No, they were all very persistent people. Yeah, I don't know where this one is right now. Hmm. Uh, open window at Collier is in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. So here we're kind of switching gears. So like I said, 1939, World War II is starting and uh, a lot of the artists fled to the United States. So um, here we're in the United States right now. This is Maxfield Parish and he was a commercial artist candles calendars. Yeah, oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, he was born in 1870 and he lived till 1966. But yeah, he was um, part of what was considered the golden age of illustration in uh, the early 20th century. And um, in 18, 1884, he and his father uh, traveled in Europe for a couple of years studying art and traveling. And when Maxfield came back home, uh, you saw that influence in uh, his art. He uh, would do uh, almost fairy tale scenes. There would be castles, there would be jesters and crowns. Uh, maybe the people would be wearing medieval or uh, neoclassical costumes. So it's a real fairy tale feel for it. But uh, it was always highly realistic, hyper realistic almost, very, very detailed and beautiful saturated colors. So um, by 1925, it was estimated that one in five households in uh, the United States had a copy of a Maxfield Parish on their wall. Of course, they were magazine covers, uh, calendars, um, book illustrations, and then later murals. So by the time he was in his 40s, he was a wealthy man. Uh, and so he declared at that point, he said, I am no longer going to be painting girls on rocks. I'm going to do what I want to do, which is paint landscapes. And so our evening shadows here is from 1950. And that's one of those uh, landscapes that he loved to do. He is famous for this color blue, the use of that co color blue to the point where it's called parish blue. Huh. 
And the way he did that, uh, he would work um, not on stretched canvas, but on canvas on board. He would lay down some cobalt blue paint, and then you take, a, you know what a stippling brush is? It's kind of a, a, a squared off at the bottom and real and around and blunt and real stiff, like you would use when you're doing, yeah, whatever. But anyway, <laughs> he would take that brush and he would pull the paint down. He would never mix it with another color. He would just take and work that that color down the the canvas, down that hardboard canvas, or in this case, up. And the cobalt blue, as it thinned, naturally you would get this little bit of turquoise color going in there. The other thing he did that made his color so rich was he would do what's called glazing. And that is a technique that originated in the early Renaissance um, where you would take oil paint. Now this was oil paint, which, you know, that would take days or weeks to dry. Then you put a layer of varnish over it, let that dry. And then another paint color of oil color, another layer of oil paint, let that dry and just keep repeating this until you got up ever many layers you, you thought you needed to get the very rich, deep color. So, okay, so there's, there's gossip about Maxfield Parish that I'm going to share. So he was married to his wife, Lydia, for 58 years. He also had uh, an assistant model, Susan, for 55 years. So when Lydia passed away and he didn't immediately propose to Susan, she retaliated by leaving him and marrying a childhood friend. And the story goes that he never picked up a paintbrush again and passed away six years later. I, I, I love that story because you're talking about all this romantic intrigue with people in their 80s. <laughs> so another person that came along doing the um, commercial art was Norman Rockwell. And he came along about 25, he was, he was about 25 years behind Maxfield Parish. So Norman Rockwell admired Maxfield Parish and uh, in a similar fashion, uh, very realistic work mm -hmm. and very detailed and the beautiful saturated color. So, yeah, Norman Rockwell was born in 1894, lived to 1978. And of course he was best known probably for his uh, Saturday uh, evening post covers. Mm -hmm. And um, he sold his first one at the age of 22. So now unlike Maxfield Parrish, who did almost the fairy tale themed things, of course, Norman Rockwell's work was more uh, Americana. It was very sentimental and nostalgic, but still it was, it, you felt when you saw it, those were people that you knew. And um, the other thing about Norman Rockwell that I think we kind of take for granted is the fact that he told such wonderful stories. Uh, that little bit of, uh, space that he used on a magazine cover that it told a whole little story and it was usually very humorous and very sweet. Mm -hmm. Now this one, our painting of uh, Dead Man's Hill here, you see the in the background here, you've got that, uh, now he did use perspective, okay, <laughs> so we've got that uh, blue gray sky and the dull brown of the buildings there. 
Of course, that's definitely no Maxfield Parish blue. It's not meant to be. It gives us a sense of the time and place that this is happening without that intruding on the action at all. So here we see the snow is bright white as opposed to our painting from Norway that Monet did, uh, bright white. So he's trying to tell a story of a group of children having a wonderful time on a snowy day. And so how does he get a group of people in that little bitty space? Well, little bitty people, <laughs> but he has to, you know, we have to see what's going on. So he used color here so expertly. The, the people, the children are all dressed in really bright, uh, high contrast uh, colors against the white of the snow. And the person in the center of the action here, of course his scarf is bright red and it's flying and his hands doing this, the gloves doing this, the bright red. So there's no question that this is where our eye is supposed to be. Also, you'd expect those children to be wearing mittens, wouldn't you? But the gloves make a better statement. <laughs> it was a choice that Rockwell made. <clears throat> so Norman Rockwell, like everybody else here, was a, a workaholic. And um, by 1969, Saturday Evening Post quit publishing. And so Norman Rockwell used that as an opportunity to do some things that he thought were more interesting and important. And um, so he did a little more serious work after that. Uh, a lot of his work had to do, there are several paintings to do with civil rights and uh, the moon landing. And uh, he did a lot of portraits of famous and important people, a lot of presidents and celebrities and such. We have a book over there that has a lovely selection of, of those later works. Okay, now. What? There's a Norman Rockwell Museum, but I could not find for the life of me, I could not find where that is located or even when it was painted. I mean, you can go online and buy copies of it, but to find out where that particular thing is, I was un unable to do so. So maybe yeah, someone was in Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. And there's, yeah, there's a museum there. But I did not find this particular painting oh, in their collection, but it might be. It might be. So in 1969, they quit painting. I mean, the Saturday Evening Post didn't come out once a week. No, they quit. They uh, because you can still pin it. By the you month. can now. It's but now it's monthly. But for a period of time there, it just totally shut mm -hmm. down. It, I think in 63, they started doing it every other week. And then by 69, they kind of go up, we're out. But yeah, now you can, now you, it comes out once a month, I believe. There'd be a lot of paintings every week. And you yeah. did so many of them. Like I said, workaholic for yeah. sure. <laughs> Might some of his works have just been, you know, whipped up for the magazine or were they literally done on canvas and then photographed to be printed? Yeah, they were. They were, yeah, they were all originally large paintings. They were. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. But that's one of the reasons why we had that golden age of illustration is because printing processes became so much more sophisticated and uh, economical that you could have a beautiful magazine cover come out every week. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. calendar. Or a calendar, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. So then here we're gonna shift gears. Oh, sure. really? We're still, 
<laughs> we're still in the United States here. Okay. I can't imagine hanging that on the wall. <laughs> well, well now, we're here to change your mind. So this is uh, by Mark Rothko. And Mark Rothko was born in Russia in 1903. And his family immigrated to the United States uh, when he was 10. They ended up going clear to the West Coast where his father was already working. But then his dad passed away uh, within a year. And they ended up going back to New York City where there was some family still. So the family escaped the pogroms of Russia at the beginning of the 1900s. Um, and so Rothko never quite felt like he was at home anywhere in the world. Russia that he was born into was gone and the United States was a little foreign always for him. So, okay. So this is mid 19th century or mid 20th century, excuse me. So after World War II, so the European artists kind of fled, a lot of them fled from Europe to New York City. And that became the hub of the art world uh, after World War II, went from Paris to New York. And there was a certain group of very intellectual and influential people in the art world that said, painting is no longer about the objective world. Painting to be valid has to be just about the paint. Otherwise it's a lie. So painting has to be just about the paint. If you remember the uh, Favs with Matisse when they were experimenting with color for its own sake, is kind of the extension of that idea. Painting was just about the paint. And that's where you have people like Jackson Pollock uh, and his splatter paintings and uh, Helen uh, Frankenthaler pouring paint on canvases on the floor. The paint's about the paint. So Mark Rothko was an intellectual and a scholar, world traveler, and his idea was that he wanted his art to be like poetry or like music. He wanted you to experience it and have an emotional reaction. And one of the ways he did that, well, let's put it this way. Okay, so this painting is at, the original for this is at the Detroit Art Institute. Uh, it was done in 1963. And it is actually 89 and a half by 70 inches. It's huge. Huge. Yeah. So this is kind of, yeah, it's huge. And his, he worked that way because he wanted people to really experience it. So uh, we don't know a whole lot about um, his techniques. He was kind of secretive about them. We do know that he was doing oil on canvas and that um, he loved Rembrandt. He admired Rembrandt. And he did a lot of the glazing techniques that we talked about in uh, the Maxfield Parish, where layer upon layer, a very time consuming process, especially if you can think that he's painting huge uh, paintings. And the edges are always a little blurry. So like the more time you sit and look at it, the more it kind of does a little bit. <laughs> so, so the idea would be if you ever get to a museum where there's a Mark Rothko, approach it with an open mind and sit with it a while, spend a little time and see if it can affect some kind of an emotional response from you the way that Rothko had intended. Give it a chance. <laughs> so to finish this program this evening, we want to thank you for sharing your appreciation of art, Gail, and giving us some insights on these pieces of art 
that we can borrow from our library to hang on our walls. And as Gail mentioned, we have a number of books that focus in on a particular artist or a particular style of painting, like she talked about Impressionism, that you are welcome to come in and check out. Thank you for attending tonight.